You know, being an instructor trainer, my job is to teach new instructor candidates how to teach, and we usually use different methodologies to do that. Part of becoming an instructor, of course, is learning how to sell three things. You've got to be able to sell dive travel, you've got to be able to sell continuing education, and you have to be able to sell equipment in some way, shape, or form. Whether you're an independent instructor or you are a store instructor, that's just the way it is. Now, when you go to sell, one of the hardest things to do is not become biased with what it is you're trying to sell or to get to your students. Sometimes you're going to have to be biased if you're a store instructor because it's what your store sells. But what you don't want to do is lie to your students for the sake of a sale. When we talk about scuba physics, there are things that we can do based off physics, not based off your personal bias, not based off your personal philosophies, and not based off what your instructor told you. So today, we're going to go out and we're going to see how physics is going to prove your instructor wrong. What's up guys, it's Ryan again from Lake Kicker Scuba and Marine. If you are new to our channel, do me a huge favor, hit this little subscribe button right here and ding that little bell as well. That way you guys are gonna be notified every time we upload new content. Now today's video is gonna be a special video for you, but before we get started, I've got some equipment hanging up over here on the wall that I've gotta grab first. So let's go ahead and grab it and then we'll get into today's video. All right, let's go diving. 27 degrees outside, not that much snow, but our roads are absolutely covered with ice. And it looks like we got a truck off the road right here. It's already wrecked. Yep. And that's right, guys. We are going scuba diving in this. And as you saw at the beginning, I'm actually gonna be using a wetsuit not a dry suit. I'm gonna be using a wetsuit for a very specific purpose. We have been asked to test a theory out that has been made about diving in a hundred foot of water with a seven mil wetsuit. And the theory goes, it's too dangerous due to the compression rate of neoprene, that you have to overweight yourself just to get down. And then if your BC fails to operate, you're not gonna be able to swim up without ditching weights. But at that depth, the theory continues to say that if you did ditch your weights, then you're gonna have to ditch so much of it that you're gonna end up having a rapid ascent on the way to the surface. So we're gonna test that out. We're gonna go to 100 feet. I'm gonna be wearing a seven mil wetsuit with an aluminum 80, and we're gonna see if I can swim up with zero air in my BC and without ditching weights. So let's go jump in and see if it's possible. All right, so we're gonna jump right on in here and I wanna do a couple of disclaimers here. One, don't worry, I am gonna show you how much weight that I'm wearing at the end of the dive. But as far as the beginning of this and the main meat and potatoes of this dive, what weight I'm wearing is irrelevant to the purpose of this video because none of us are identical. My weight requirements will be different than your weight requirements. <coughs> but I am gonna show you at the end of the video exactly how much weight i'm wearing what you need to understand i am in a seven mil i do have an aluminum 80 i am wearing ditchable weights which typically i do not do um, and the main goal is to prove a point here that as long as you do not overweight yourself regardless of what depth you're at you can still swim your scuba system up without the need to ditch weights this is going to sound very harsh to begin with, but I want everybody to take this to heart. Your BCD is not a buoyancy control device. It's a buoyancy 
compensating device. If we remember back to the old sea hunt days, uh, Mike Nelson never had a BC. He was properly weighted for every depth that he went to, and he never had an issue with swimming to the surface. Um, typically, if he ever had to ditch weights, he had to ditch weights at the surface, not necessarily down below. So, that being said, even if you're wearing a system like I've got on in this video with ditchable weights, you can still dive a balanced rig to the point where you don't need to ditch it. And to be honest, you're going to see throughout here, I'm going to do a quick weight test, but you'll notice that I don't even touch the BC once we go under. So even as I'm descending down, you will notice I'm not putting any air in the BC to get neutrally buoyant as I descend down. I am properly weighted for a hundred feet of fresh water for this particular dive. And I'm controlling my buoyancy, not with my buoyancy compensator, but I'm controlling it with my lungs and my breathing. And you'll see that <clears throat> not only as I go down, you'll also see that as I come up. Now, the first part of this, this dive will be edited because it took about four minutes to reach the bottom because we were going slow. We needed to make sure the camera was working. But once we make the ascent, the whole purpose of this video, there will be absolutely zero cuts from the maximum depth all the way up to our safety stop depth, which was about 20 feet. So as we're descending down, you'll notice that we are in our local quarry here. The visibility was not very good at all. We maybe had at the bottom about five foot of vis, um, but once we got our lights on and stuff from the cameras, then you'll see that there was um, good enough visibility to make this video. <coughs> and like I said, I want you guys to understand that this video is not meant to call anybody out or to say that someone's a bad instructor or to say that certain philosophies in themselves are bad. It's just to prove a point that I think the scuba industry is faulted with overweighting students just to get them underwater. I know a lot of instructors were trained to do that. Even myself, when I first became an instructor, we were taught, hey, if it's in a three-foot pool and you're just trying to get them to go under, throw a couple extra pounds on them just so that they can stay down and have a good experience. And the reality is that's dangerous, even in a three-foot pool, because you, you're training that student up front that if they're having difficulty manipulating their gear, that you should just overweight yourself because you are wearing a buoyancy compensator and you can kind of compensate for half an addict extra weight and that's not good that's that's really dangerous to do so here we're at the top of the cruiser we're going to drop down about another 10 feet and we're going to get down i think we're about 84 feet here we're going to drop down to about 94 feet now i know that i stated it was going to 100 feet we are at the mercy of uh, the environment at this point we can't hit 100 feet in this quarry um, it kind of it's a self-draining quarry it's got a little pipe that drains out but here you can see i'm at 94 feet and I'll show you the computer again real quick. 94 feet, total bottom time there of four minutes. That's how long it took me to get from the surface down to this depth. I'm going to show you that my BCD is completely empty. We are simulating a failed BC, a catastrophic failure in our BC. Wearing an aluminum 80, wearing a 7 mil, I'm going to prove to you that you can swim up without ditching weights, even in a 7 mil with an aluminum 80. And I'm going to, I'll try to put a timer here on the screen for you guys, just so that you can see how long it actually takes me to go from that depth up to my safety stop depth. Um, just to prove to you that I'm not going too fast. I'm actually going a little bit slower than what your normal ascent rate. And if you listen closely, you'll notice our computers are not beeping at us. They're not telling us that we're going too fast neither. But I'll put a timer here on the screen for you just so you guys can see just how long it takes me to go from 94 feet in this situation up to a safety stop depth of 20 feet. I also want you to pay close attention to two other things. One, there is a guideline there. And the reason we're using the guideline is we wanted to make a vertical ascent, but considering that we were only able to reach 94 feet on this dive, we decided to make a diagonal ascent and to follow that guideline because that guideline is not going straight up. It is going diagonally. So hopefully that'll get us the extra six feet by going diagonal. 
Um, but I'm not pulling on the guideline. I'm not using it to assist me in any way. I'm not adding air to my BC. Every bit of my buoyancy control is simply done with my breathing volume, nothing else. My legs, my kicks, that's not, what, that's not making me go up. That's what's making me go forward because I am going diagonally, I'm not going vertically. So I'm using the kicks to propel myself, but I'm using my breathing to rise up. And you can do this too with proper training and by not overweighting yourself, you can do this. The last thing that I want you to focus on is my actual kick patterns because I'm gonna change them. I'm gonna switch from a frog kick over to a flutter kick and back to a frog kick to show you it doesn't really matter what you do. If you are properly weighted, you do not have to be afraid of using a 7 mil with an aluminum 80 and going to 100 feet. I've heard other instructors say this, and when we got challenged for this, I was a little concerned when the gentleman asked us about it um, because this came from a training agency, not just a specific instructor. This, this came from a training agency that's out there teaching this, and I, I'm not sure what their intentions are. Is it so that they can sell more dry suits? I, I don't know, to be honest with you. I just know that the information was not correct. Um, I think because of the way the industry is as a whole, we do teach uh, overweighting, which we shouldn't do. We should teach proper weighting. We should spend more time uh, with students in the pool, getting them properly weighted. And we should really promote the fact that every time they get a new piece of gear, whether it's a wetsuit, a dry suit, or a new BC, they should be going back to their confined water areas to practice getting properly weighted. It's not that difficult to do. I don't know why people are afraid to, to practice in a pool or practice in your local environment, but you know we should be doing buoyancy dives all the time. Um, when we teach the SSI Perfect Buoyancy class, it's typically a one-day course. You've got about two to three hours of classroom uh, if a student decides he wants a traditional classroom. And then we spend about three or four hours in the pool with them going over proper calculations, proper weights. We talk about uh, even distribution of those weights. And it's something that I think a lot of divers can benefit from. I'm not sure why some people think that the, the course is not beneficial, but to me, it's a, a very, very important class that just about all divers could take. And here you can see, yes, there is a compression rate with wetsuits, but not all wetsuits are created equally. Trust me, guys. There's a company out of Hollandale, Florida called Wetwear, and they basically make incompressible neoprene wetsuits. They're made from a material called Rubitex, and yes, they'll compress at deeper depths, but at standard recreational depths, you know, zero to 130 feet, they do not compress. If you're interested in one of those suits, check out the link down below. I'll put their link. You can actually go and watch their YouTube video. As a matter of fact, I'll link that video down below, and they can show you how their suits don't compress. So when claims are made that you can't dive a seven mil to 100 feet while, aluminum, while wearing an aluminum 80 because it's too dangerous, because you won't be able to swim it up, as you can clearly see in this video, that is not the case. So there you could tell at the very end, I completed my safety stop and now I'm walking out of the water. And you can tell by the timer, I did not exceed my, um, my normal safe ascent rate and made it back to the surface safely. All right, guys, come here. I want to show you something real quick. Because I know somebody's going to ask the question, well, how much weight are you actually wearing here? And I want to show you. On this particular BC, I have front pouches that are ditchable, and I have rear pouches. And we've talked about this in other videos. The biggest mistake new divers and even experienced divers make is they overweight themselves. Currently, I'm wearing a 7 mil thick suit, brand new, straight off the shelf. I do have on underneath it the Ultra Skin from Mario's that is completely neutrally buoyant once it's wet. You can kind of see it here. It's what you guys saw me wear in the tropics. But I do want to show you the weight that I'm wearing here. I have in the back a three pounder. On this side, I have a three pounder, total of six pounds so far. Here in the front, if we pull out the weight pouches, I have A three pounder so now we're at nine pounds and the last thing here is a three pounder 
I have a total of 12 pounds with a seven mil wetsuit, three mil gloves, and a three mil hood. That's it. The water was extremely cold. We were in depth of uh, say 100 feet or 94 according to the computer. And I have an aluminum 80. In a catastrophic failure of your BC, if you do not overweight yourself, you can swim up. All right, guys, so there you go. You tell me, do you think you can swim up from 100 feet while wearing a seven mil in an aluminum 80 cylinder? I think I just proved that it is possible. Now, the key here is, of course, do not overweight yourself. And I think this is one of the biggest problems with the scuba industry. I think it's one of the biggest problems with instructors out there with certain mindsets or certain philosophies is they feel like you gotta overweight yourself to compensate for whatever reason. Guys, I just proved that as long as you don't overweight yourself, when we talk about balanced rigs, it's not so much, because you guys know I dive non-ditchable systems, it's not so much not having ditchable weights or having ditchable weights, it's having the right amount of weights. Being properly weighted no matter what it is that you're wearing, a dry suit, a wetsuit, a backplate and wing, a jacket style, being properly weighted is crucial not only to your safety, but it's also crucial for you as a diver to grow and to get your skill sets where they need to be. So if you're the type of instructor out there that is telling your students that you've got to have a dry suit at this depth, please stop that because you are lying to your students for the sake of a sale of a dry suit. That is not the case. Make sure that you are properly weighting your students and you as the diver, make sure you are properly weighting yourself as well. But guys, if you liked the video, give me a big thumbs up. Definitely share it as well. I hope it answered some questions, but if you got further questions, drop it down in the comment section below. I'll try to answer it the best I can and as quickly as I can. But guys, as always, make sure you follow us on Instagram and Twitter, like us on Facebook, pin us on Pinterest, subscribe to us here on YouTube, and as always, guys, we appreciate your business.